Hey everyone, this is Sam Cohen uh, from River Network. I'm the uh, Science and Policy Analyst, and on behalf of River Network and our Wild and Scenic uh, 50th Anniversary Partners, which include American Rivers, American Whitewater, River Management Society, and the four federal agencies managing the Wild and Scenic System, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar on engaging diverse communities uh, during Wild and Scenic 50th Anniversary Celebrations. Just a quick background on, on River Network. Um, for 29 years, River Network has filled a unique position in the environmental community uh, by focusing on, uh, primarily on the 2,000 plus river and watershed organizations uh, that work at the local and state levels um, from all over the country. Um, and we're also trying to strive to engage a, a much broader audience to support healthy rivers and water resources. And today, uh, we focus on three strategic areas um, that are important for healthy rivers, and those uh, are clean water and strong champions uh, to protect rivers. Uh, we have free and paid uh, membership, op membership options at River Network, and we encourage those who aren't yet members to join either as individuals or as part of their organization. And also a big thanks to those of you on the line who do, um, who are uh, who are River Network members. There's lots of great benefits uh, for both the free and paid options, uh, and you get to be a part of a thriving, diverse community that's passionate about rivers. We are engaged on wild and scenic issues and the 50th anniversary uh, this year, um, and we're supporting that through webinars like this and a few we've done earlier this spring. And we're also um, completing a survey and needs assessment of groups from around the country that are working on wild and scenic rivers. And this assessment work is um, helping to inform the direction and, and focus of a national, a new national coalition that is just now getting started uh, on wild and scenic rivers. So thanks to everyone um, who we've been able to connect with on that needs assessment. And uh, with that, I will hand it off to Lisa. Thank you, Sam. Um, so thanks everybody for um, for attending today. And Sam, I don't need um, the presentation controls. We'll just go to our our first presenter here shortly. Um, okay. Today we are covering a, a variety of learning objectives. We want to give you the tools through uh, different case studies to better connect with different diverse audiences. So we have a variety of speakers today talking about how you can better engage with a, a, a variety of key, co key populations, including students, uh, veterans, and members of the military, outfitters, and uh, the Latino community. Um, so with that, Danielle, um, do we have you on the line yet? No, uh, okay, so we'll go ahead and, okay. hi, Danielle. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm Yes, here. we can, just in time, just in time. Yes. Um, so, um, Sam, if you want to go ahead and queue up Danielle. She, she is able um, to present, although it sounds like we're getting some echo. Uh, Danielle, if you can mute your computer speakers, that should uh, fix that. Got it. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Perfect. Okay, great. Well, um, Sam, if you want to queue up Danielle, um, so I'll introduce um, Danielle. So Danielle Perry is an assistant professor at Northern Arizona University in the School of Earth Sciences and Environmental Sustainability. Her research focuses on the tensions between water resources conservation and development in the United States, Latin America, and China. She is particularly interested in the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act and how it can be used as a policy framework around the globe for biodiversity conservation and climate adaptation. Before entering the academy, Danielle worked as a whitewater guide for over a decade. Danielle will illustrate for us today the value of cultivating campus community uh, to engage students in water issues. The first student water symposium at Northern Arizona University provides such a venue uh, to discuss river conservation, and Danielle will highlight 
successes and lessons learned from this year's panel discussion and film screening, as well as other student symposium events. So Danielle, go ahead. All right, thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, can you all hear me? Um, yes. So, great. So this year uh, was the first, as Lisa mentioned, the first year that we launched the annual Student Water Symposium at NAU with the goal of connecting the campus and the community through discussions of water. Uh, this symposium is open to all undergraduate and graduate students across the campus to present any of their research on water. And this year's theme was celebrating the Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th anniversary. Um, so in order to do that, the, the graduate students in my water resources policy and management course were tasked with organizing this two-day symposium. And here you see the team of nine graduate students uh, that all worked diligently to uh, take care of their tasks which included advertising the event, recruiting students through abstract submissions, uh, um, earning or gaining uh, community donations and grant funding to financially support the symposium and um, creating a website, et cetera. So the first thing we did was uh, call for abstracts across the campus where students could submit um, their research topics. And as I mentioned, this is open to students from any department on campus. So the goal was to get students not just from the sciences or political science, but also from literature and art. Overall, we had 63 abstract submissions for oral presentations and poster presentations. We received a very strong support from the community donors uh, for items that we ended up raffling off um, in, during the evening events to raise funds to support future water symposium events. And we received a generous uh, grant um, fund from, the, from Quasi for their Let's Talk About Water Film and Water Symposia grant series. Um, and this, that funding was matched with funding from the University of, um, from Northern Arizona University uh, to pay for this two-day event, which included bringing in um, our evening speakers uh, and panelists for the film screening that I'll tell you about in just a minute. So we advertised the event around the, around the community and around the campus. We spoke on the local radio, science radio show, this is the Colorado Plateau, talked about the event and, uh, and the purpose of the event and a little bit about the 50th anniversary. And then we put together a panel of uh, folks who are related with and working within the Wild and Scenic River system in some way. Our keynote speaker on Thursday evening was Tim Palmer, who um, many of us are really familiar with. He's an author who wrote the Wild and Scenic Rivers and American Legacy book. Um, he's written over 20 books related to um, river and wilderness conservation in the United States. So he um, attended the, the Thursday evening speaker. He was our keynote speaker. And then on Friday, he sat on a panel uh, among five other people, including David Morick for American Rivers, Cisco Guevara and Louis Hena, who were featured in one of the films that we screened, the Avanyu film. Uh, Tim Palmer was on the panel, Marcos Roybal, who was the local Forest Service uh, river, river coordinator for the Fossil Creek Wild and Scenic River in Arizona, one of only two rivers in Arizona designated wild and scenic. And then Dr. Abe Springer from the School of Earth and Sustainability, who is an eco-hydrologist and helped with the restoration of Fossil Creek before it was restored. And I moderated this panel. Um, and all together, we, we screened three films the, the Friday evening um, for 
for this film screening and panel discussion, which was funded by Quasi. We screened 62 Years, The Green and Yampa Rivers, which talk about, this film talks about the, the fight to save these rivers um, in Dinosaur National Monument and how that led to the creation of the Wild Scenic Rivers Act. And then Avanyu uh, is, speaks about the importance of wild and scenic designation for native peoples in the United States. And then Every Bend uh, is a film that captures community involvement in the push to get more rivers protected in Montana. So overall, this two-day wild and uh, student water symposium featured oral presentations, poster presentations, both days during the day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. In the evening, we had these two events that were open to the public. People, community members came in, they listened to Tim speak, they watched these films, they asked questions of the panelists, uh, and it was a really great way to uh, expose some people to the wild and scenic river system that otherwise didn't know much about this policy and the system and to uh, get students thinking beyond the classroom but thinking about potential careers and um, and connecting them with some of these professionals who were there for this symposium so here you see uh, in the in the upper left hand corner, uh, a student group giving a presentation about their work with the Grand Canyon Trust and thinking about water in the Colorado Plateau region. On the upper right, you see students in the poster presentation. In the bottom left, this is uh, one of the award winning presentations about um, integrating groundwater valuation studies in the in decision making for water policy and adoption in adaptation to southwest in the to climate adaptation in the southwest US and this links particularly to rivers that are on the nationwide rivers inventory in Arizona forests that are vital for fresh water and other ecosystem services in this region. Um, and the bottom right was another uh, award winning presentation about tamarisk in the rivers of the western United States and the influence of that um, invasive species um, in our river system. Overall, this symposium helped to expand the network um, of students and professionals, more people involved in river conservation over time. And here you can see Tim, Tim Palmer on the left giving feedback to students who had worked up a poster presentation on the wild on the Yampa River and the need for gaining permanent protection of that river in the future. And then on the right, um, some of the student organizers of the symposium and the panel discussions, as well as professionals from New Mexico Wild and Rio Grande Restoration that came over from the symposium. So through this symposium, there were um, collaborations that were born out of this meeting of minds here. Um, so overall, I would say that this symposium was really successful in getting students uh, trained up in how to present in professional settings and how to communicate with professionals from the community and overall expanding the um, the knowledge of the Flagstaff community about wild and scenic rivers. Thank you very much. With that, I'll pass it back to Lisa. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, awesome to hear such great successes um, in engagement with students. So we'll move on to our second speaker, uh, Soleil. Soleil Black served as search and rescue in the U.S. Coast Guard for four years on H-60 helicopters and C-130 planes. She now serves as a volunteer outings leader with the Sierra Club's Military Outdoors program. Soleil will share successes and personal stories on veteran and military engagement, including the Sierra Club's annual Memorial Day river trip on the Chattooga Wild and Scenic River. Thanks so much for joining us, Soleil. Go ahead. 
Hi everyone, uh, I'm Soleil. I'm with the Sierra Club Military Outdoors. Um, so a little bit about myself, I am a volunteer outings leader. Uh, I've been, I'm with the Sierra Club Military Outdoors and I spent four years in Coast Guard Aviation. I do have a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Management and I would consider myself a full-time adventure ultra, ultra marathon runner, mountaineer through hiker, and I spent four years with the Sierra Club Military Outdoors, though I can honestly say I've probably been with the Sierra Club since I was uh, old enough to walk. My mother actually volunteered for them for years. So a little bit about the Sierra Club. It is one of the oldest, largest, and most influential grassroots environmental organizations in the United States. It was founded on May 28, 1892 in San Francisco, California by a Scottish conservationist and preservationist, John Muir. Um, it has hundreds of thousands of members throughout the United States and around the world. Just a little bit about John Muir. He was born in 1838 and died in 1914. He was the one who encouraged President Teddy Roosevelt to create the first national park, which is Yosemite National Park, and what we consider our first military outdoors outing. Uh, the Sierra Club's mission is to explore, enjoy, and protect the wild places of the earth, to practice and promote the responsible use of the earth's ecosystems and resources, to educate and enlist humanity and protect and restore the quality of the natural and human environment, to leave our children a little legacy of air, safe drinking water, and natural grandeur, and to use all lawful means to carry out these objectives. And our motto is to explore, enjoy, and to protect. It is through the practice of this motto that Sierra Club Military Outdoors Program was born. Um, our goal of the National Sierra Club Military Outdoors Program is to educate the military and veteran communities about the benefits of the outdoors. And we really want to bridge the gap between the conservationists and the military community. Um, basically, for most of us military veterans, we have served to defend this land, and that's what we want to continue to do is defend this land as veterans. Um, the Sierra Club actually has a long history with military veterans. Our first executive director, was David Brower from 1952 to 1969, and he served as an Army Lieutenant in World War II in the 10th Mountain Division. Just a little bit about the Sierra Club. Uh, we were founded on May 28th with 182 charter members. By 2016, we had 64 chapters nationwide, and we had 250 million of acres of protected land. So we have several goals with the military outdoors. Um, we do want to train outing leaders. We want to find additional volunteers. We want to raise funds for local leaders and organize local and national outings. We would like to educate the public a little bit more about the Sierra Club Military Outdoors and grow programs throughout the country. We do this with partnering with uh, veteran service organizations such as Team River Runner, Our Bound, Team RWB, and Hope for Warriors. Um, Sorry. So one of the great things we have is a partnership between the Nantahala Outdoor Center and our military outdoors program. And basically what they do is they train veterans and military members the skills necessary to work as professional river rafting guides for commercial outfitters. Um, this is for commercial outfitters, summer camps, whitewater clubs, outdoor schools, and many more. Um, I actually have several friends that went through this program. They love it. They do this every single summer. Uh, they travel around and they absolutely love it. The Nantahala River uh, is a great place to raft and to be a guide. Um, so I highly recommend if you know anyone to put them through this program. It's absolutely free as well, just to let everyone know. Um, we also have the Military Outdoors Program. Uh, other programs that we have going on this year are the Gorges of the Lower Salmon River Rafting Trip. We have the Land We Defend Intro to Fly Fishing Trip. We have the Wild and Scenic River of No Return Rafting Trip and the Gates of Lodora River Rafting Trip. As you can see, our Military Outdoor Programs are pretty much all centered around rivers. Um, a little bit on the personal side, so I was actually in aviation with the Coast Guard. And so I served four years, and it was it was great. My deployments were to islands in the middle of nowhere. I spent a lot of time flying. I did a lot of rescues over water. So I, I absolutely love water, and it's ironic because I'm absolutely terrified of it. Um, 
and that's honestly because of a lot of my experiences in the military. And uh, during my time while I was in, I did actually develop PTSD in 2008 um, due to a few experiences. And so I got out and I kind of found myself a little bit lost. And that's when I had the luck of stumbling upon the Sierra Club Military Outdoors program. And what you can see on the screen is actually uh, pictures from my very first trip where we actually climbed a Gannett Peak in Wyoming. And it was a week-long trip. There were seven of us, three guys, and uh, we slept outside and eventually got to the base of a mountain and climbed it. Um, it was an amazing trip. I really loved the veteran community that I met with, and uh, many of these people I'm actually still friends with today, and I actually climbed again with. Uh, last year, I actually did the inaugural Memorial Day River Run. Uh, these are actually pictures from this year, and I was really excited because uh, if you see where my little mouse is and you see the smiling face, this is one of my friends who just recently got out of the Marines, and this is the joy she had uh, when she was going down the river when just weeks prior she had been talking to me seriously about issues she had had with separation from the military and the anxiety that she had, the depression that she was dealing with, which is something that we all deal with. And this is the joy she had, and this is actually her whole family right here, um, that she got to experience going on this river. And that's why these trips are so important, because they do transform us. They do heal us. And since the trip I went on last year in 2017, the fall of 2017, I became a military outdoors leader. I've led several trips since then. And I continue to be an outings leader for the Sierra Club Military Outdoors. And um, I think it's a great organization. And I absolutely love it. If you do have any more questions or know people that should join us, you can contact Rob Vessels. And um, thank you for all that you do. And we hope to continue this partnership. Thank you so much, Soleil. Um, so we'll move on, keep moving through um, our presenters. So we now have Crystal Johnson. Crystal manages guest services for Sherry Griffith Expedition, a longstanding whitewater outfitting company. Crystal will illustrate uh, her company's commitment to rafting with purpose during the anniversary year by recounting successes from a special 50th anniversary Yampa River trip designed to inspire clients through education about Yampa River management and the Yampa status as a proposed wild and scenic river. And this trip literally just took place or, or ended, I believe, last week. So, um, Crystal, uh, go ahead and um, tell us all about it. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? I'm sorry. I'm not sure that's showing right. Yes. Can you see my screen? Uh, I do see your screen. Yes, yes, see I see blue. Is okay. that yes. Yes, they are. Great. Okay, perfect. So and I'm I'm apologizing in advance. I ended up with a flu bug this week and my voice is really yucky, so I am sorry. Um and I am at work too. So um so we Cherry Griffith Expeditions work together with River Management Society and the National Park Service to put on a celebration trip of the, of the Wild and Scenic 50th anniversary on the Yampa River this year. It launched on May 24th. Um, so I got back last week, but it's, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the Yampa is beautiful. It is, it is a beautiful river. It is not wild and scenic. It is proposed wild and scenic, but it is not wild and scenic. Um, and so... Uh, there are lots of forces in play there, but uh, whether we want it to be wild and scenic or not wild and scenic, I am not uh, I am not qualified to determine that. <laughs> but um, so America Outdoors, we met Risa, Emma, and Risa met at the America Outdoors Association meeting in 2016. And if if other outfitters or whatever are not a member of America Outdoors, should definitely look into that. It's a really great program. Um, they are there to help in so many ways. And so they're a really great thing. And, you know, through the conference, that's how we hooked up and we're able to put together this trip. So uh, the the Yampa River trip was kind of the brainchild of Emma and Risa. And then we took 
we put it together and we did four days, three nights on the Yampa and it was it was beautiful. We had time for presenters, we had time for visiting and we had time for rafting, of course, because that's what we're there for. Um we let's see, sorry, moving on. The biggest key there was collaboration. Um we all had to work together. It couldn't just be, oh, we're gonna do this trip and be done. Um we worked with with many of the people from River Man River Management Society to put together a presentation. Um each each of the, our guests that were from the River Management Society on the trip took some time in the evenings and really worked together to collaborate their information so it was all presented very well um, and so that they could do, pre present information to our guests who were on the trip about what the whole wild and scenic thing is about, to, about the rivers and maintaining them as pristine as opposed to overrun and over undermanaged. Um, not only did we work with River Management Society, but we also worked with, very closely with the National Park Service and Dinosaur National Monument. Um, Mark Wilson was awesome. He was really great. He worked hard to help us make it a, make the trip a success. Um, without their help, then we'd have been in we'd have been in colder water than we were in. So you know, sometimes we're on our head a little. Um, also, some days we felt like this. It was the last chance for real beer. So uh, the first day of the trip, we met up, we launched. Um, the Yampa is really great in that we always, we call it the day one rapid because you have rapids all day. And it's a really fun and exciting trip. Um, and so, uh, and again, more, more photos because you can't go wrong with photos, right? Um and the group discussions each uh, each member of the river management society that was on the guest on our trip with us took an evening and presented a 35 to 45 minute presentation and sometimes those presentations went long but that's okay because it was answering the questions of the guests the guests were there to learn about river management and how how it works and why we need it and what the point is of it and so it was really nice to have to have that those experts there that knew what they were doing they'd worked in rivers for a long time they'd worked in management of rivers and they were there to kind of they gave us a lot of really great insight as to how it works from both sides um you know as a boater on the river you just think oh yeah let's go boating but when it comes down to the nits and grits and keeping everything really safe um and clean and pretty and pristine and to ensure that best outdoor experience for every person on the river. The Park Service and, and other organizations, BLM and things like that, they work really hard to make sure that those uh, rivers are kept beautiful. Um, and of course, we had plenty of river time. We, we floated, we boated, we rafted in the white water. It was it was a great time, and then, and there were little pop up discussions all through the trip as to you know different sites along the river and different. Of course, the guides with our guides were there with the interp and the extra beauty, you know, the extra information and stuff about the river itself. Uh, we did some hiking. The Yampa is got some really really great hikes, um, and then on. The, not the last day of the trip, but the second day of the trip, the third day of the trip, I'm sorry, we had the Park Service come and do a presentation for us. Um, and one thing that we, one of the things that was a collaboration with the Park Service is they have to be very careful about what they say and do. They cannot, they can't just jump behind a, a cause. The, their staff have to be very, very political and not say things that they shouldn't and do say things they don't the only say things that they are allowed to or permiss permitted to just so that they don't cause any any problems for themselves or for their park or for um the the government itself and so that was there was some back and forth with the park services about what they could actually do and say and we ended up we we had Mark Wilson come out and he was scheduled to be somewhere else and he took the time to make sure that he was at the luncheon and able to present and talk to us 
Um, and it was really great to have him there. We really appreciate everything he did and put into it. Um, takeaways. Uh, the difficulties with this, there was a lot of planning that went into it. It didn't just happen overnight. As I say, the first first brainchild happened in, in 2016. And so it takes a lot of time, a lot of planning to make sure that it all goes off really well. Um, a lot of collaboration. You know, there's the Park Service, the River Management Society. You know, we all work together. You know, we can do the nuts and bolts of the trip, but the River Management Society was great in helping us put the word out to other people, um, helping us market, also in getting us guest speakers, which we loved having all of them with us. And then also the National Park Service, we had to make sure that we didn't need any special permits for what we were doing to make sure that we had everything that we were on board and they were on board and everything was good. Uh -huh. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, collaborate, uh, the guest buy-in, we needed to get, uh, we needed to have guests not necessarily buy into the idea that they're doing a trip that is the Wild and Scenic 50th anniversary, but we were looking at trying to get the guests to buy into the idea of river management and, and what it takes and supporting us, or supporting the River Management Society. We also had to have um, our guides buy in. We the, and I call it a difficulty just because we had to get them all on the same page, so that they knew what the trip was about, so that they could present the best possible experience for everybody. Um, benefits? There's a lot of benefits of this. Education went a long way. It was awesome. I got reviews from some of my guests from the trip. They were just saying, you know, I just loved it. They, the people were so knowledgeable and there was so much awesome information. Um, we did get the guest buy-in. We, we had a lot of people that were really excited about supporting, uh, supporting Wild and Scenic and supporting the idea of keeping rivers clean and pristine and wild and scenic. Um, we got new commitments from our guests and from our guides who were, um, you know, they they all were more enthused about the river and what it takes to help keep it keep it ready and ready to go and beautiful. And so that was really great. And then we were also, we were able to donate a portion of the fund, or a portion of the proceeds, and a good portion of all the proceeds that will be donated to the River Management Society as part of this trip. And so there there was a lot of really great benefits associated it was it was worth the difficulties we'll put it that way and so that's what I have and I'll turn it back over to Lisa thanks thanks so much Crystal and and thank you um, for your company's dedication to rivers clearly a lot of effort that had some great payoff for uh, for rivers and river education going forward um, and with that I'll introduce our last two speakers um, if folks have had questions, we are going to hold questions till the end, but I would um, encourage you to think about questions that you have for any of the panelists who have spoken thus far. And for our last two panelists, and go ahead and type them into the chat box at your convenience. And after our last two speakers uh, finish, we will go ahead and uh, start taking questions. So um, with that, I'll introduce our last two um, speakers who will, will be uh, kind of tag teaming and speaking together. Melissa Martinez is a Forest Service Wild and Scenic Rivers Fellow through a partnership with the Hispanic Access Foundation. Her work this year in the Forest Service's uh, Washington, D.C. office focuses on incorporating diverse communities into the Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th celebration and providing collaborative partner support. Jenny Brandt is the Environmental Programs Director for the Hispanic Access Foundation and leads the Latino Conservation Week initiative. Together, Melissa and Jenny will discuss Latino Conservation Week, a week-long initiative in July created by Hispanic Access Foundation to get members of the Latino community into the outdoors. Uh, Melissa and Jenny, go ahead. Hi, Lisa. Thanks so much for the introduction. Um, so, like Lisa said, um, I'm here at the Forest Service DC Washington office uh, in partnership with the Hispanic Access Foundation. Um, and it's been awesome getting the chance to work with the 50th Coalition 
um, and just kind of share resources um, and collaborate on different projects. Um, Jenny's going to go ahead and kind of give a rundown of Latino Conservation Week um, and the general history with that, having been the one who's moved a lot of these pieces. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and give a brief breakdown of how we've been um, incorporating rivers into these projects. Great. Thank you, Melissa. Um, if you'll head to the next slide, um, this is Jenny with the Hispanic Access Foundation. We are a nonprofit based in the D.C. area um, that connects Latinos and partners um, with partners and opportunities to improve their lives and create an equitable society. And our vision is that one day every Hispanic individual in America will enjoy good physical health, a healthy natural environment, a quality education, economic success, and civic engagement in their communities with the sum of improving the future of America. Next slide, Melissa, please. Um, what we've noticed is that we have a growing Latino population here in the U.S. And um, today, what is 17% or as of 2010, what was 17% of the pop total population, um, Latinos will make up 30% of the total population by 2050. And that has um, a tremendous um, amount of, of spending power, $1.4 And we also see that Latino... Um, Latino groups um, have expressed a really strong attitude and, and support for conservation values. Uh, and so that's what we really are trying to lift up with Latino Conservation Week is demonstrate how supportive they are of protecting their local environments. Melissa, next slide. Melissa, can you uh, move to the next? Thank you. Um, and as we've seen through polls that we've conducted, um, we found that Latinos have grown in the number of Latinos who consider themselves conservationists. So an increase of 18% has occurred just since 2016. And 71% of Latinos consider themselves outdoor recreationists. Um, this is a group that we took out to um, Joshua Tree National Park. Latino Conservation Week, as I said, we're heading into the fifth year of Latino Conservation Week. The events will take place this year between July 14th and 22nd. And in 2014, when we started, there were just 16 events. And in 2017, it grew to 120 events um, nationwide. And this year, we hope to hold over 150 events across the country. Um, to give you an idea, some of these sites have rivers, and I think Melissa's done a survey of the sites where we have interns like her placed around the country at National Park, um, Fish and Wildlife Refuge, and uh, National Forest sites. And she's conducted a survey to see where all the rivers are in the, in the scenic rivers um, where we'll be conducting events. And this is just a short list of some of the places where we've held events. Um, obviously, with over 150 events last year, we couldn't get them all on the slide, um, but this is a pretty good representation of where we had events in the previous years um, in terms of the map. Now, overall, we've had over 280 events, and at those events, we've had 15,000 community members attending. Um, we encourage everyone on the call to check out the latinoconservationweek.com website to find events near you. We're adding events every day, um, and we'll expect to see those 150 events posted prior to the July 14th date. And overall, we've had 16.5 million media impressions. There's a ton of um, coverage that different media outlets in English and Spanish give to Latino Conservation Week, and we're very, very active on social media, and so you can already begin to see the hashtag Latino Conservation Week or the shorter hashtag LCW2018. 18 being used on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Um, this is just, again, a partial list of sponsors and participants. Um, I don't know if you see your own groups there. If you'd love to see your groups participate, we'd love to, to engage with you. And you can reach um, me at my contact information that will be given at the end of, of the presentation. Um, and also, you can reach us through latinoconservationweek.com. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, Jenny. Um, so 
Like I mentioned before, um, I am here at the Forest Service office helping out with 50th anniversary related everything, basically. Um, and so I've kind of been also working with Hispanic Access Foundation and setting up um, events that they previously had that were river related and kind of incorporating the 50th anniversary in that way, and then helping build these new partnerships and relationships um, throughout the 50th year to make sure that they're sustainable um, and that we create kind of this awareness within the Latino community that the 50th anniversary is going on. Um, and so this was a perfect place for us to incorporate the anniversary. Um, and so I kind of wanted to share a couple of really great examples um, and ways that we've managed to kind of create these connections. Uh, so this first one here um, is going to be held at the Angeles National Forest on Piro Pier Creek which is a wild and scenic river. Uh, and this is in partnership with Self-Help Graphics and Arts, which is an amazing organization uh, in East LA. And they're dedicated to the production, interpretation, and distribution of print and other art media by Chicano and Latino artists. And the great thing about this organization is that they're extremely uh, present in the East LA community. I myself is, am from East LA, uh, and I had worked with them previously, but there's a Forest Service uh, Hispanic Access Fellow currently located at the Angeles Forest, and she previously interned with them and thought that this would be a perfect partnership because they do a number of different projects around a number of different causes in the area. Uh, and because Fear Creek is there, um, we thought it'd be a great spot to kind of draw awareness to what's going on um, with the creek. And so what's going to happen for this event in particular is we're going to be uh, providing transportation to get them out to the creek and just do a number of different activities and kind of host um, an art uh, an art space for them to collaborate and work on different projects. And then from there, they're going to go back to their area or to back to the work that they do um, and kind of design different uh, wild and scenic river uh, art pieces. So just different ways to show their relationship to the river and how they've connected to it. Um, and the, there's kind of an entrepreneurial um, component to it where they kind of design these pieces and put them together and then the organization helps them find different ways to show their art or advocate for whatever causes they feel are important. Uh, and so in kind of helping create this connection to wild and scenic rivers, we hope that this could kind of be a, a sustainable project that's carried on every year since we're going to be helping get them out um, into uh, the the forest and help them kind of meet uh, the Forest Service to um, make this project kind of a continual thing every year. Uh, and so I thought that was a great example to share because, you know, it's an awesome local organization that's really well established and they don't typically do stuff outdoors. It's a lot of, um, it's a lot of different projects, but this is definitely going to be a newer one for them and I'm really excited to see what's going to happen there. And another awesome event that we're going to be having this year uh, is in partnership with Conejos Clean Water, which is a great organization um, that does a lot of work in creating public awareness and encouraging advocacy and education around different environmental issues, social issues, economic and food justice issues, as well in the Conejos land grant region. Um, and so a lot of their focus is around clean water. And so this year, uh, because of the 50th anniversary, um, they reached out to me because they had uh, been in contact with another Hispanic Access Fellow um, and asked about the 50th anniversary. And so we ended up reaching out to a local outfitter um, and the outfitter is going to be providing a free river trip for them as well. And so this is also going to be supported by the San Luis Valley Ecosystem Council. And we're hoping to also make this an annual thing every year to kind of create education um, around wild and scenic rivers and get uh, the local youth um, component of the Conejos Clean Water Coalition out on the rivers. And so this is going to be a really great summer activity for them to engage with the river um, and just kind of also create general awareness. So those are two pretty big events that I'm really excited to have had the chance to help host. And I think in working with the Lat Latino community around um, wild and scenic rivers, the biggest thing for me has been kind of um, helping create connections to just all rivers. Um, a lot of the events I'm also helping plan are not specifically wild and scenic. They might be around brooks, streams, creeks, or just general rivers in the area. And I think 
that that that's been really helpful because a connection to any river is you know fantastic and um it's been really great also getting to work with other latino based organizations like latino outdoors green latinos latinx hikers brown people camping melon and base camp just all these amazing outdoor um latino based organizations that are already doing such incredible things and helping plug in the 50th anniversary into what's going on and then also partnering with Latino based organizations that might not have an environmental focus, but could have more of a public health focus or uh, more of a social justice focus and just kind of creating those intersectional relationships, um, you know, for social change and just kind of creating a convergence for issues of civil rights, environmentalism and general public health. Uh, so for me, that's been something that's been a definite growing experience and learning experience, but also it's been awesome to get to connect with everyone and just share wild and scenic rivers. Um, so here is my information if you'd like to kind of see different ways that we can collaborate um, for Latino Conservation Week and the 50th anniversary as well as Jenny's information um, for all things Latino Conservation Week. And with that, I think I am done. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Melissa and Jenny, so much. Um, so we do have uh, time for some questions, so I would encourage uh, attendees to type your questions into the chat box uh, if you have not already done so. Um, before we do get into questions, I want to make one quick announcement, and that is uh, on July 19th, which is a Thursday, at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, we will be having uh, an additional webinar in collaboration with the Trails 50th community. So the, uh, the, the folks who are orchestrating the 50th anniversary of the National Trails Act. Uh, that webinar will be dedicated to communications and to helping um, grassroots and small community organizations um, with tips, tricks, other sorts of advice for communications related to uh, local events. So again, it, it'll be structured similar to many of the webinars that you've attended already, either for rivers or for trails, and that we are bringing a variety of different examples to bear from the field of successes of different events that have already taken place and communications that have supported those events. So look for more information on rivers.gov uh, under our toolkit as we um, will be putting up more information here very shortly about how to register for that webinar. But um, save the date, that is July 19th, a Thursday um, at 1 p.m. Mountain Time. And with that, um, Sam, I think you uh, need to drive the Q&A. So if you, if you wanna go ahead and, and take that over and um, go ahead and, and uh, go ahead for questions. Sure, thanks, Lisa. We already have a few questions. Um, I guess I'll start with one for Soleil. Um, Sarah Johnson asks, how do you recommend non-military focused outreach programs appeal to uh, military and veterans uh, families? And are there specific things that should be considered when developing programming and uh, then messaging around that program? I think we've actually lost Soleil. Um, Soleil, are you on, on the line? No. Okay, we will try to try to get that question to Soleil, but in the meantime, um, for Crystal, a uh, similar uh, question, who was your target audience uh, for your guests uh, for the event, um, and uh, who was RMS teaching? Okay, so our target audience was pretty much anybody, um, but our, so a lot of the guests came from, they just kind of came from all over. We had some that were return guests that came rafting. We had some that were on previous trips that uh, moved to that trip because they were excited about the, the wild and scenic portion of it. And then we had a lot of guests that came through uh, the uh, River Management Society advertisements that they put out, uh, just kind of word out, word of mouth out to their their participants and their their base, basically. Um, we 
I'm sorry, what was the other half of the question? <laughs> we had who the man or who we were looking for, but then what was the other part of the question? Um, who who was RMS teaching, which I think you sort of addressed. They had, they had a follow up, which was uh, who were the guests on the rafting trip, which I, I think you answered, and then were they specifically community leaders, or was registration open to everyone? And uh, what was the yeah, and registration was open to everyone. Okay. Um, we just we just had it listed on our website. Uh, we did send out newsletters and such to to market it, as we would any of our trips. Um, and then the the river management people we had we had Bunny Steren, um, Risa. Um, oh shoot. Hey Crystal, could you could you qualify those names for people who 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 may or may, or may not know those individuals, um, yeah. if they have titles or kind of Let what me. what organization they're associated with or representing? Sure. So give me just a second. We I I didn't have that information just off the top of my head. Let me chase that down. Uh, okay. So Linda Jalvert was one of them. She is. I am so sorry I didn't have that information right off the top of my head. Um. Well, so maybe more generally, um, I'm assuming there were agency representatives there from the Park Service as well as there, well, so the, B, the, the BLM? Service. Yes, there, so the the park service man was not able to be on the rafting trip with us, but he met us at Echo Park where we held our luncheon. Um, we had someone from the BLM. We had someone from the, let's see, okay, so there was, uh, well, Matt Blocker was going to be on, he was from BLM, but he had to be replaced by somebody last minute, uh, one of his cohort. Uh, Linda Halbert, who I believe had worked in the national parks with like river management in the Grand Canyon. Uh, Bunny Steren, who I'm not sure, I know that she worked in, she was part of river, river management society as well. Um, and then- Yeah, Marisa it's Bunny from the BLM. Was, oh, it's Bunny from BLM too? Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yep. I, yep, Bunny's from BLM. Awesome, thank you. I'm sorry, I don't have that off the top of my head. I'm past that trip working into June. So, um, yeah, so we, I mean, we had some really, really great people who were there presenting information and also giving us, um, it, it, taking it, you know, helping the guests see the point and the, the reason for why we were there and why we we're celebrating. So it was good. All right, thank you, Crystal. Um, someone asked uh, if the webinar recording would be available, and, and yes, uh, we will send out a, an uh, email with the link to the recording for all attendees. And um, one other question here uh, from Itzel Rosales. Uh, she asks, it seems that most of these events have uh, targeted adults, and could any, any one of you uh, address how it is best to engage young underserved populations. So anyone uh, feel free to jump in. Sure, with the Hispanic Foundation, I can speak to that. Um, this is Jen. Um, we work with, with all kinds of groups. We work with faith-based organizations, and so oftentimes um, they have youth groups, um, or you, young members who participate in our events, um, and the organizers themselves are college age um, individuals, and so the events are really open forum. They could be anything from um, a picnic by a river, a movie screening about rivers, um, to um, a rafting trip or a, a or a paddling event, and so we reach. Um, Students of or people of all ages with our events and, and are happy to serve intergenerational families um, through events. Um, and I guess for pointers on how to do so, you know, it helps when you can reach out to organizations that that serve that population. Um, 
like faith communities or many of the organizations that we work with um, that work on issues of importance to the Latino community. Great, thank you, Jenny. Uh, does anybody else have anything to add to that? I'm here. This is Danielle. Can you hear me? Yes, go yeah. ahead. Hi, so working in the university situ setting, I'm working with young adults um, in teaching classes from the freshman level all the way up through the graduate level. And so there's kind of that transition population of students who, um, who are oftentimes still living at home or frequently going back to their parents' homes but also living on their own for the first time. And so they're a youth group that are becoming more educated and open to learning about policies like the Wild Pink River system. And then they're taking that information back to the older de generations. And then with the Student Water Symposium as an event that's open to the public, especially those evening events that are more general in in nature, less um, academic and, and created more for a general population. There were quite a lot of um, young folks, you know, children um, and teenagers who attended the evening events for the slideshow presentation by Tim Palmer and then the screen, um, the film screening events. So that those types of evening events are um, with free food and um, kind of a more general presentation are welcoming to those younger generations to still get them into a place where they can do the learning about the policy and the system. Um, I can also uh, speak to that a bit. Um, so in planning kind of these events that are more family uh, focused, We've had a lot of um, really creative ideas in incorporating rivers, just because sometimes people aren't too close to a river, but we still want to make sure that they can celebrate, you know, any river that they want. Um, so one event that we're doing um, is actually incorporating kind of uh, rivers into uh, the National Mall. We're going to be kind of having like a slip and slides and a water day with balloons, uh, or I'm sorry, with bubbles and just water games. Um, and that's going to be held by um, one of the National Park Service interns. And it's just going to be a water day with a bunch of fun stuff for kids uh, of all ages. So uh, there's smaller stuff like that. We also have a freshwater snorkeling um, event happening over, I don't know which river, um, <laughs> but uh, it's a, that one's geared more towards second and third graders. And then we have some smaller water monitoring projects going on in New Mexico as well. And those are geared towards, I believe, fifth and sixth graders. Um, and so it's just kind of a bunch of these smaller um, projects I've been working on that are more kids focused and, and kind of engaging youth. And uh, there isn't as big of a Wild and Scenic Rivers component. It's more of a rivers focus and kind of river education. Uh, but it's been really, it's been really fun kind of helping create these uh, other ways that we can get youth more involved with Wild and Scenic Rivers. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, I think we are at the end of our questions now. Uh, Lisa, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, I do not, but just want to give a special thanks to all of our, our panelists today uh, for talking about different ways to engage your diverse community uh, for the Wild and Scenic Rivers 50th anniversary. We look forward to having you on our next webinar, like I said, June 19th, Thursday, 1 p.m., to learn about communications and communication strategies uh, and successes from local events conducted for the Wild and Scenic Rivers and Trails 50th anniversaries. So we thank you for attending and um, please visit rivers.gov 
uh, for our 50th anniversary toolkit. There's a lot of information up there. That's also where we will be posting the recording of today's webinar. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.